Greetings, GMAT enthusiasts. Greeting, hope, uh, greetings, hope you're doing well. Uh, my name is Gene Suhir. I'm very excited to be here with you today, invited by GMAT Club, uh, to lead you through some topics that, well, you know, well, I'm, I'm a Kaplan teacher. It's probably important for me to mention. Uh, I've been teaching GMAT for Kaplan for about a decade. Before that, I was a, a Kaplan GMAT student. Uh, and one of the things we love to do at Kaplan is to take some what otherwise might seem like uh, complex or tricky topics that show up frequently on the GMAT. Uh, and kind of boil them down to their nuts and bolts, make them palatable, and give you some plans of uh, plans of attack. I use that proactive verb deliberately. It's good to take control of this exam. Uh, what we're going to be doing here with this hour is we're going to be doing this with overlapping sets. So our uh, uh, agenda, essentially, our agenda, uh, well, we have our welcome. Welcome. Uh, again, I'm Gene Su here, uh, going to be leading you through overlapping sets. Happy to be here with you, invited by GMAC Club. Uh, we're going to introduce you to overlapping sets, three different approaches, different ones are going to be more useful in different situations. We'll have kind of a plan A, a plan B, and also a plan C uh, to give you kind of more tools in your toolbox to kind of reduce the house advantage that the GMAT test makers otherwise might have. And throughout the process, giving you some tips for success. Uh, we'll also have a uh, little Q&A. We'll try and leave some time at the end for a little Q&A portion. So let's get right into it. You see here a sample GMAT problem that talks about overlapping sets. Now, what do we mean by overlapping set? Well, you have different groups that may or may not overlap with one another. 96 attendees at a local convention of musicians, out of those, 23 perform on the trombone, 17 on the piano, 15 perform on both. They overlap. The question reads, how many attendees performed on neither of these instruments? So plan A is to utilize, ta-da, the overlapping sets formula. Total equals group A plus group B minus both plus neither. Now we'll go through the math here and then talk about the, the underlying logic for why this formula is what it is, can help you internalize it and sort of uh, wield its heft appropriately, uh, you'll get a chance to try out even a similar problem on your own right after. We know the total number of attendees, 96. Group A, we'll call the trombone people, that's 23. And group B, we'll call the piano people, that is 17. Now, when you label your group A and group B, when you use this formula approach, they do need to be groups that could potentially overlap. How about the both? Well, that we also know, 15 performed on both. What we don't know is the neither. That's what the question's asking. Now we put in the appropriate math symbols, total equals group A plus group B minus both plus neither. Now we just have to you know, sort of clean it up a little bit. Uh, when you use the formula approach, uh, really math itself usually fairly minimal. We add up our 23, 17, and negative 15. 17 minus 15, of course, is 2. So 23 plus 2 is 25 plus neither. Subtract 25 then from both sides. We have our neither is 71. Now, here's why the formula works. Let's say that you showed up at this convention and you were given the duty to count up all the musicians. You have a clipboard. I, I imagine that's the kind of thing you'd want to have a clipboard for. And they tell you, oh, we have 96. So when you do an accurate uh, count, you better end up with 96 people. So you walk around and you say, hey, trombone people, raise your hands. And they raise their hands and you count them up. Say, OK, there's 23 of you. Put your hands down. Then you go count the piano people. You say piano people raise their hands and they raise their hands and you count them up and say, OK, there's 17 of you. Put your hands down. But now what about the people that have raised their hands twice? The, the ones that play trombone and play piano. You have now double counted them. So what you've got to do now is to remove them from your count once. And that's where the minus both comes from. Then after that, what about the people that didn't raise their hands at all because they don't play trombone, they don't play piano. You still have to count them. They're, they're still musicians. So that's where that plus neither certainly comes from. Now, you want to have, if uh, you haven't already done so, you want to have some scratch paper with you, of course, uh, any kind of note, uh, anything to, to take notes with. Uh, certainly feel free to, to take screen, any kind of screenshots, certainly if you would like, because I'd like to give you the opportunity to try out a similar problem on your own. This next one right here, uh, give you about a minute or so, maybe just over a, a minute or so, uh, to try this one on for size and see how the formula works for you in this problem.
All right, so you're uh, you're probably curious to know how you did. Uh, let's talk about how the formula works here. When you are given four out of the five elements of this formula, oops, sorry, wrong button. When you are given four out of the five elements of the formula, then using the formula really should be your plan A. Total equals group A plus group B uh, minus both plus neither. We know the total here, 37 manufacturing companies. We know group A, <laughs> quite literally, uh, group A, association A, 21. 18 in group B, four are not members of either trade, trade association. So that's our neither. The both we don't know, that's what the question's asking. How many are members of both of those trade associations? So what we can do now is clean this up, utilizing the formula, a little bit of very light arithmetic involved. 28 plus 14 plus, uh, plus 18 plus four minus those in the both category. The 21, 18, and four, Add up to 43 minus what is 37 minus 6 is 37 is answer choice B. Now, this formula approach works very nicely. If you are given four out of the five elements then of the formula, the formula is your plan A for overlapping sets, where the math itself fairly minimal, very minimal. Now, let's talk about your plan B afterwards. Here on Grove Street, out of the 19 houses that have no basement, Six have a garage. If eight houses on Grove Street have a basement but no garage, how many total houses have no garage? Now, how would the formula work here? Do we have four out of five elements of this formula? Do we know the total number of houses? No. Do we know the total houses that have a garage? No, already we're not going to get four out of five elements of the formula. This is where we need a plan B. And the plan B, if you're not given four out of the elements of the formula, is to use a table approach. And the table approach is really universally useful for anything you're trying to track, any possible combination when you have two overlapping sets. We'll make our column headings with a mutually exclusive pair. Either you have a garage or you don't have a garage, and then the total. We'll make our row headings mutually exclusive pairs. Either you have a basement or you don't have a basement, and then the total. Now, the way this chart approach is going to work is that if you have, uh, think of it this way, almost like playing Sudoku, uh, every row is going to add up to the total on the right. Every column is going to add up to the total on the bottom. So that in any row or any column, if you know two out of three cells, you can solve for the remaining cell. And this table approach is useful really to track any combination of uh, sets that, of uh, two sets that do overlap. So let's fill in what we know. Out of the 19 houses that have no basement, so no basement total 19, out of those, six have a garage. That's no basement with garage. Eight houses have a basement, but no garage. Basement, no garage is eight. Now, what I like to do when I'm using the table approach, if you're like me, and, and I know I am, you might want to somehow label, uh, I like to, to bold it in some way, uh, label what is your magic box that once you get a number in that box, uh, that is going to give you then your, your final answer. So our final answer, we're going to want to have how many total houses on Grove Street have no garage. All right. So in that middle row, we know two out of three cells. We can solve for the remaining cell. Six plus what is 19? Six plus 13 is 19. Now we have two out of three cells in that column going up and down. And every row and every column needs to add up to the total. Eight plus 13, that gives us 21, our final answer. This becomes the kind of thing when you use the, the table approach. You know, um, I have the benefit here of computer animation. Uh, when you draw your table the day of your exam on that, uh, on that note board, it doesn't have to be pristine, doesn't have to be a work of art. It just has to be legible enough in order for it to be helpful to you. So let's give you a chance to try out one on your own here immediately afterwards. We'll throw in a little twist and make it a data sufficiency problem here in this case. Remember, the table approach is really universally useful for two overlapping sets to track any possible combination of overlap. So take a couple of minutes. See how you fare with this one. Good luck.
how did that how did that feel huh uh feel free by the way if you want to in the uh the comments below feel free if you want to put in what uh what your final answer is um this is a yes no data sufficiency question uh do more than 55 participants attend session b if we can get a definite yes or a definite no to that question uh, from a statement we will have attained sufficiency notice from the information that we're given up top originally what we don't have is four out of the five elements of the formula. So the formula, we're not gonna use. Plan B, we're going to end up utilizing here the table. So if we use that table approach, and we at Kaplan, by the way, call the five answer choices, one, two, T, E, N for data sufficiency. And it just helps kind of with the shorthand to remember when to pick which answer. You can certainly refer to it as A, B, C, D, E, if you would prefer. So we're going to have our column headings, group A, not group A, the mutually exclusive, you're either one in one group or not in it, and then the total. And our row headings, either you're in B, not in B, and then the total. Now we fill in what we know. Total of 80 participants, that's when you count everybody, A, not A, uh, B, not B, when you count up everybody, total, total. 60 attend session A. So that'll be our session A, total, 60. Seven participants attend neither session. So not A, not B, we're going to have seven there. But the magic box, the one we're especially interested in, do more than 55 participants attend session B, yes or no? So session B total, that's the box ultimately that we are interested in. Now, I'm going to put here on the screen, uh, for the sake of being thorough, what the math afterwards would look like. Uh, but really, you could set the standard for sufficiency and just ask, well, what would I need? in order to find that magic box. Now, in that, uh, uh, in that table, there's a few other things we're able to fill in. The row on the bottom has to add up to 80. So 60 plus 20 is 80. The column down the middle has to add up to 20. So 13 plus seven equals 20. Statement number one tells us fewer than 20 participants attend session A, but not session B. So we have the same table that we have before, but now with this additional information, the fewer than 20 participants attend session A, but not session B. So A, but not B is less than 20. Consider the logic here of what's about to happen. That leftmost column would have to add up to 60. Well, if that middle box in that left column had been exactly 20, the box right above it would be 40. But as we have less than 20, the box above it has to start getting greater. So that'll be something greater than 40. Now the top row. If you have something greater than 40 plus 13, you'd have something greater than 53. But the question is, do more than 55 participants attend session B? If it's greater than 53, it could be 54. That would give us a no to the question. It could be 56, for example, would give us a yes. So we don't have a definite answer to their question. Statement number one, insufficient. And we knock out one in E or A and D if you wanna call it that way, the first and fourth answer. See already some uh, answers coming in here in the comment. Now, what about statement number two? The number of participants who attend session B, but not session A, is the same as the number of participants who attend session A, but not session B. Again, the magic box. And we fill in what we already knew from the original question, forgetting for a moment we ever even saw statement number one, so that we can evaluate the statements individually, of course. Our uh, first line of attack is evaluating the statements individually before we even dream of evaluating them collectively. We knew that there were 13 participants that were in B but not A. Statement two is now telling us that we're going to have the same number of participants, so also 13, for those that are in A but not B. Now that column needs to add up to the total on the bottom, 60. What plus 13 is 60? Ah, 47. Now we can add the, col uh, the row, excuse me, along the top. 47 plus what is 13? 60. Do more than 55 participants attend session B? You betcha. Statement number two now gives us a definite yes to their question. And statement number two, again, is sufficient. No need to combine statements since statement number two had already met our minimum standard for sufficiency. So if that's the answer you got, it looks like some of you got it. Uh, if that's the answer you got, beautiful. Uh, I hope that helped reinforce some best practices. And so if you missed it, it's really equally beautiful because the number one best way for you to improve your performance in GMAT world uh, is really to get burned on things and then learn from your mistakes. 
I put up the math for each of the statements individually, really just for the sake of being thorough. Um, but really, if you just recognize from each statement which boxes you'd be able to fill in, you maybe wouldn't even have to go that far. So plan A using the formula when you have two overlapping sets, if you know four out of the five elements of the formula. Plan B for two overlapping sets is if you don't know four out of the five elements of the formula, then you set up the table or chart approach that is really universally useful for two overlapping sets to track every possible combination of overlap. Now let's talk about the plan C. Look over this problem. See if you can identify how many sets there are that would overlap. This time, it's not two overlapping sets. This time, we have a total of three overlapping sets at Kavinsky Middle School, a, a fine institution. We've got French, Spanish, and Russian. Well, so what do we do? There is a version of the formula that you could potentially use when there's three overlapping sets, but it's really long and gets ugly. Uh, group A plus group B plus group C minus those in group A and B minus those in A and C minus those in B and C plus twice the number of those in all three groups. You get the idea. So long and cumbersome that especially under timed conditions, as you will be under on the GMAT, it uh, uh, would be ill-advised. What about the table approach? Well, if you have three overlapping sets, how would a table work? You have to make a, a three-dimensional table. What are you going to do, a, you know, origami uh, in the middle of your GMAT, right? I don't think so. There are indeed three overlapping sets, so we need a plan C. Plan C is going to be, ta-da, the Venn diagram. The Venn diagram is usually not the most efficient manner of going about things when you have two overlapping sets. But you know, when you have three overlapping sets, yeah, the Venn diagram quite easily helps you, uh, I was about to say, see things visually. How else can you see things? Visualize literally the areas of overlap. We just have to make sure we are carefully putting in the right numbers into the right regions. They tell us upstairs that among the eighth graders at Kavinsky Middle School, 25 take French. 20 take Spanish, and 20 take Russian. Now, before we move any further, one of the things that's really important to recognize when you use this Venn diagram is how many uh, regions you have within a given circle. Take, for example, this French circle. The French circle really has four regions within it. So when we're told there are 25 students taking French, it's all four of those regions combined that would have to add up to 25. Visualize here the ones that do just French, the ones that do just French and Spanish, the ones that do just French and Russian, and the ones that do all three. So that total has to be 25 with all of those regions. Same idea for the Spanish circle. All four of those regions within that circle are going to have to add up to 20. And same with the Russian circle then all four of those regions are going to have to add up to 20. Now, what are the other pieces we're told that we can fill in? Out of all these students, four of them take French and Spanish only. So we go and find that region. Where are you, French and Spanish only? Ah, right here, going to be four, where French and Spanish overlap, but not Russian. Six take French and Russian only. So where French and Russian overlap, but not Spanish, we're going to put in a six. Seven takes Spanish and Russian only. So we'll put in then seven where Spanish and Russian overlap, but not with the French. Now, one other thing they tell us, and that is that five students take all three languages. So the polyglots they are, they're gonna be where all three of those circles overlap. Now the question reads, how many of these students take exactly one of the languages? So what we're really interested in are the parts of each circle that don't overlap with anything else. Those that take French only, those that take Spanish only, and those that take Russian only. So let's go one circle at a time. It's a good idea when you're a GMAT test taker to have like a, uh, you know, be sort of systematic or scientific about things, not just with considering your plan A, plan B, and plan C, 
for overlapping sets, as we're discussing in this hour, uh, but also what you're doing within each of those approaches. So the French circle has to add up to 25. We already have six and four is 10 plus five is, fifth, uh, is 15. So the remaining region then to get up to 25 has to be 10 taking French only. Très bon. What about the Spanish circle? In our Spanish circle, we have to add up to 20. We already have three regions, the five, four, and seven. That adds up to 16. We got to get up to 20. So now we have four people in that remaining region for Spanish. That's Spanish only, muy bien. And now the Russian circle. We got to get up to 20. We already have six, five, and seven. So that's 11 plus seven, which is 18. Now we have two, ochen uh, that speak Russian. How many students take exactly one language? So we'll add up those pieces, 10, 4, and 2, and we'll have those that take exactly one language, 10, 4, and 2. Always a good feeling when you have an answer that's in the answer choices, right? See some Ds coming up, Shabba, Mali, and Rajandeep. Answer choice D is the right one. Now, we're going to give you another problem to do on your own here in just a few moments. Uh, feel free to take screenshots again throughout this hour. Um, but it, it, the the big takeaway here, I think that the headline really is if you have three overlapping sets, there is a version of the formula you could use, but there's a lot of places to get tripped up in it. And really, you want to have less daylight between you and the GMAT point. The table approach is off the table. Uh, when you have three overlapping sets, you have to make a three dimensional table. So plan C is what you go to then. And that would be the Venn diagram. Now, Let's try having you do one. Ah, go right to data sufficiency right here. So take a couple of minutes, try this one on for size, and see how you fare. Then we'll review. All right, time to review. Let's talk about the analysis here. Um, notice we had three overlapping sets, right? Builders in a new housing development use three types of flooring, carpet, tile, and wood. And each one of those types is used in exactly 45 homes. So we are going to have some overlap already we see here at the beginning. I laid down the one, two, TEN at the bottom, our answer choices that we call them at Kaplan, the shorthand to remember when to pick which answer. Certainly you can call them A, B, C, D, E if you would like. So we're going to have three overlapping sets. Formulas off the table, tables off the table, the Venn diagram is very much on the table. 
So we've got our 45 homes. Each of those types is used in 45 homes. So our carpet circle has to add up to 45. Our tile circle has to add up to 45. And we also have our wood circle has to add up to 45. They don't tell us the total here, those scamps. So that we'll just leave off to the side here and call it X. Then what can we fill in? Each home has at least one type of flooring. So there aren't going to be any homes that are going to be floating around in the ether uh, outside of these circles. All these homes are going to be somehow in one or more of those regions. Ten homes have both carpet and wood, but no tile. So we find where carpet and wood overlap, but not tile, and put a ten in there. We also are told that there are 25 homes with all three. Put a 25 in there where all three of the circles overlap. A lot of flooring variety in those homes. Then, are there any homes with only carpeting? So the region we're especially interested in, I'll put a question mark there, is where we have carpeting only. Now we can set our standard for sufficiency before launching into the statements, taking a few moments to do so anyway with data sufficiency uh, helps make going through the statements go so much more smoothly. So what can we fill in now from statement one? Statement number one has 10 homes have carpet and tile only. You should have set the standard for sufficiency before you launch in the statement, hey, if we got the region that has carpet and tile only, we'll have three out of the four regions. Then we have for that carpet circle, we'll have sufficient information to solve for the four. That's exactly what we're given in statement number one. We're given there are 10 that have carpet and tile only. So that whole circle has to add up to 45. We're already at 45. 25, 10, and 10, we're already at 45. So there are going to be zero homes that have carpet only. But keep in mind, this is a yes, no data sufficiency question. Are there any homes with only carpeting? The answer is no. A definite no. There are no homes with only carpeting. That's what makes statement number one sufficient. We knock out the two T and N, uh, or B, C, and E, certainly if you want to call it that. See some A's coming in here in the, uh, see some A's coming in down in the comments below. All right, let me take away what we have from statement one. We go to statement two. Five homes have wood and tile only. Let's go find that region. Five homes have wood and tile only. Okay, it's right here is going to be five. Now, if you didn't already recognize at that point that this would be insufficient to give us the region we need in that carpet circle, I mean, if you did recognize it, beautiful. If you didn't recognize that, okay, you can do a little bit more and say, okay, the wood circle has to add up to 45, 25, 10, and five gets us to 40, five in the remaining region, but that gives us a, a hot cup of jack squat when it comes to the region that we actually need. So statement number two, then insufficient. No need to combine statements. Statement number one by itself was sufficient, or, or A, certainly if you want to call it that as harsh, Obama, number of you said down uh, down in the comments. Uh, go ahead and take a screenshot if you'd like. Um, I think we're we're doing okay on time, right? I think we can slip in uh, slip in another problem before we do our uh, Q&A. So excuse me for one moment. Yeah, let's go and bring up, uh, oh, don't want to ruin the surprise too much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, give me a couple of minutes to try out try out this problem. Uh, one of the uh, kind of curveballs here is they never actually give you the hard concrete numbers to work with, only the percentages. So see what little adjustment you might have to make. Good luck. See how you fare.
I put on a, uh, a headset here. I'm told that uh, some folks hear a little bit of uh, 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 hear a little bit of, of beeping. We don't hear any beeping. The joys of living in the internet age. Uh, so you should have recognized here that we had two overlapping sets: desktop and laptop. So the Venn diagram would not be the best approach, nor would be the formula because we aren't given four out of the five elements of that formula. Uh, remember that the table really the most universally useful when you have two overlapping sets. So we make our table where we have laptop, no laptop in total, desktop, no desktop in total. The tricky thing here, of course, is that they didn't give us concrete numbers. They only gave us percentages. Well, the total of anything, of any group, is 100%. So we can label our total total. Everybody, laptop, no laptop, desktop, no desktop, uh, total, going to add up to 100%. Now, what can we fill in? 60% owned a laptop computer. And so we can fill that in. So laptop total will have 60%. 10% own neither a laptop nor a desktop. So no laptop, no desktop. We have 10 there. We are ultimately interested, the match box, what percentage of the total households did not own a desktop computer, the non-desktop total? There are a few additional things we can fill in before we go to the next part of the problem upstairs. The bottom row has to add up to 100. 60 plus what is 100? 60 plus 40. So we have 40%. We then have two out of three elements of the uh, two out of three cells in that middle column. What plus 10 is 40? That's 30%. Once you get some practice in with these different approaches, they start to become dare I say, maybe even a little bit fun as uh, uh, you kind of get accustomed to when to use which approach. So we have uh, another thing that they tell us. Three times as many laptop owners did not have a desktop computer as had both a laptop and a desktop. So three times as many laptop owners did not have a desktop computer. So we're talking about laptop uh, owners here has had both a laptop and a desktop. So we'll call the laptop desktop people X percent for now, and the box right underneath three times as many. So we'll call that three X. We get a nice little equation cooking here that that leftmost column X and three X has to add up to 60. Four X equals 60. Divide both sides by four, X equals 15, and this breathes new life now into our table. So our X is 15, our three X three times as big. 3 times 15, 45%, and now we can get the magic box. Notice the table helps you track any possible combination of overlap. 45 and 10 adds up to 55%. So we can even use these approaches, even if we're not given the uh, like the concrete numbers, but if we are given here the percentages. Uh, go ahead and take a, a screenshot here, certainly, if you like. I saw it down below. We had some Ds uh, coming up here in the comments. Uh, if you missed it, don't just sleep over it, right? It's a uh, it's always the student who's able to say, all right, they got me on this one, those, those scoundrels, but here's what I could do a little differently next time. I mean, that, I think that's the student that all GMAT teachers really bet on when test day comes. So before we uh, open things up for a QA, and a and you can already, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, if you want to, to put down in the comments, and uh, I'll try and answer as many as I can uh, within this hour, uh, but you could also leave them there, and then uh, one of us uh, from Kaplan or from GMAT Club uh, we'll help answer those uh, those comments that you can put down below too. So uh, before we do that, though, here are really the uh, the headlines. I would say the inner monologue of the GMAT champion you're training to be. If you're trying to make overlapping sets become easy, become manageable for you, uh, which I think is the goal really for any GMAT topic, is to have your inner monologue ask yourself certain key questions with overlapping sets. How many sets might potentially overlap, either two or three? If there's two overlapping sets, the formula is plan A. Are you given four out of the five elements of the formula? If the answer is yes, go ahead and dive right into the formula. If you're given four out of the five elements, that's usually going to be the most time efficient approach. But if you're not given four out of the five elements of the formula within the problem, uh, we saw that in a, a few cases certainly here, then plan B, use the table approach. And if there's three overlapping sets, that's when you would want to use then the, uh, the Venn diagram. That, that's really like, if there's one thing for you to take from this, I, I hope there's more than one thing that you're taking from this hour. But if there's one thing to take from this hour, uh, yeah, well, 
three things, I guess, uh, I guess, technically. Uh, thank you for your hard work. Let's, uh, let's leave things open for a Q&A. Any uh, questions, comments, concerns, so on and so on. If you got a, a chance, by the way, and I think, uh, I think we had it uh, or we're posted, or if not, we'll, we'll have it posted. Uh, check out some of Kaplan's uh, free GMAT resources. We have a free practice test, question of the day, uh, what we call a 20 minute workout, certainly for GMAT too. Any questions, comments, concerns? Now's a good time to, uh, now's a good time to post them. I'll try and answer some as they, uh, as they come in, or if any pop up, you can certainly put them in the, uh, certainly put them in the comment section at, at any time. And one of us from Kaplan or GMAT club, We'll be monitoring those and try and answer some. Yeah, don't be shy. Post any questions you have in the chat box. I'll try and answer whatever, uh, whichever ones I can that come up. Or I guess maybe over has overlapping sets then become uh, become so easy that now you really have a have a plan of attack. I I hope that would be I hope that would be the case. All right, Shubham asked the question. A uh, maximum of how many questions from overlapping sets appear in a test usually? So uh, it varies. It varies. Uh, as you know, it is an adaptive test. Uh, so it's going to vary. Um, I, I would answer the question this way. In lower difficulty problems, you're going to see more than involve the, um, uh, more than involve the formula being the more useful one to see. With... Uh, more medium difficulty problems, more often the table with higher difficulty problems, more often the Venn diagram. Uh, how many you see, uh, most students usually report maybe seeing like two or three, uh, although, you know, give or take, there's a, uh, uh, there's a margin here. Um, usually see like two or three. Part of that, though, is luck of the draw. Like, let's say the, uh, the scoring algorithm is pulling questions from like a pool of, I don't know, let's say 600 uh, level questions maybe they'll pull one that's with overlapping sets. Maybe it'll be some other topic. Uh, I wish I'd give you a more specific answer to that, Shubham. So you're not going to see a ton. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you're not going to see a ton of them, but you know, you're likely to see a few, uh, enough definitely to care about overlapping sets, and they're good opportunities to, um, uh, good opportunities to bank some fast, easy points. Uh, Satya Brata asks, and I, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong, is it not advisable to remember the formula? for three overlapping sets. Not really. I, I mean, I'll say it again, if you're interested, if you wanna talk about it with friends, um, total equals group A plus group B plus group C minus those that are in A and B minus those in A and C minus those that are basically are subtracting uh, all of the overlaps of two groups. So minus A and B minus A and C minus B and C plus twice the number of those that are in all three groups. Um, and then plus those that are neither. But uh, I brought it up just for the sake of being thorough. Yeah, it's not advisable because even if you memorize it uh, under time conditions, there's so many places that you can get tripped up with that, right? A minus turns into a plus, a plus turns into a minus. And with such a, a lengthy beast of a formula, um, it might be kind of hard under time conditions in particular to catch yourself. So not advisable. To remember the formula for uh, for three overlapping sets, not advisable. I mean, your test, your choice, but yeah, we wouldn't recommend it. Uh, let's see. Pujita asks, "How will the most difficult question from this topic look like?" All right, that's a good question. All right, here's the hardest kind that I've ever seen. It was a data sufficiency problem where there were three overlapping sets, and they gave us a few of the regions but with a number of unknown values um, where, so think about the total, right? You have a total of uh, seven uh, regions, right? When you have the three overlapping, uh, when you have the three overlapping sets. Um, the hardest I've ever seen is where it had that. They gave you then three of these seven regions. They gave you the total and nothing about the ones that do like region A only, region B only, region C only. And what we essentially uh, had to do on that problem is to just set up some equations and say, all right, well, I have four unknown values, right? They give me three of the seven regions. I have uh, 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 then a, uh, four remaining. 
with unknown values. Let me see what kind of equations I can get cooking here. And then uh, this uh, hardest overlapping sets problem I'd ever seen. I think there's like a 720 or 730 level problem. And you had to get some equations going for, well, here's the equation for this one circle. Here's the equation for another circle. Here's the equation for the third circle. Okay, that's three equations. And they told me, well, seven of the regions would have to add up to, that's a fourth equation. Okay, so I have four distinct equations. I have four variables. Hey, I'll be able to solve. That's that I think is the the hardest overlapping sets problem that I've that I've ever seen. So I hope that helps. That that's what the most difficult questions, Pujita, what the most difficult questions from the topic look like. Uh, three overlapping sets when uh, uh, you're not uh, in data sufficiency, uh, when you're given some of the regions but not others, and you got to see how many equations can I get going. Or remember a good general rule of thumb: however many variables you have that's how many distinct equations you would need to solve for each variable. I hope that helps, Vegeta. Let's see, Satya Bratha said, received two questions. Yes, that's about right, right? There's usually like two or three, but you know, give or take, you might see one, might see four. Not a hard and fast number. Uh, one was three, okay, so three overlapping sets. Um, and the other was a property of sets and a must be true question. Yeah, that sounds yeah, that sounds certainly like it uh, like it could happen. Uh, problem solving, of course, rather than rather than data sufficiency. It sounds to me like that's a case where um, you know, oh, are there certain things that we can fill in definitively? Are there certain things that we can't fill in definitively, uh, where they wouldn't have to be true, but rather only a range of values that we can fill in definitively? Yep, I've certainly seen that happen. But yeah, the same approaches, Satya Brat, the same kind of approaches would certainly hold. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Why not use the table to solve three overlapping set problems? Well, think about how your table would have to look for that harsh. You would have to start making uh, a three-dimensional table or some triangle, which, I mean, you're not gonna sit there doing origami with your no-board, right, to make a three-dimensional table or some kind of triangle that you would have to make with three different overlapping sets, right? I mean, try try doing it with three overlapping sets. You're going to find that it's, uh, uh, if it seems kind of cumbersome, it should. Uh, there's not really a very efficient way to do a table with three overlapping sets. I hope that helps, Harsh. Rajamdeep, how many questions from data sufficiency in sets can we expect? Yeah, I wish I could give you a hard and fast number for that. Um, so figure if on average you see maybe like, uh, let, let's say two or three uh, overlapping sets problems on your exam. Uh, figure just based on the percentages of how many overall problems in GMAT quant are problem solving versus data sufficiency. It's not quite at parity, but, but almost. So figure data sufficiency versus problem solving, uh, pretty close to 50-50 most likely. I wish I could give you a definite definite answer uh, to that. But yeah, figure, you know, uh, probability tells us, and I, I believe if memory serves me, I think we're doing another uh, event coming up soon, uh, Kaplan and GMAC Club. Uh, I might be wrong, but if memory serves me, I think we're doing another one in a couple of weeks that deals with probability. Uh, we hope you join for that. Uh, but yeah, probability is if, let's say, you see four overlapping sets problems, probably two and two for problem solving and data sufficiency. I hope that helps Rajan Deep. I hope I got at least three and four. Oh, thank you, Shubham. Thank you, Shubham. Glad you enjoyed it too, Satya Brata. That's the idea, right? It's, it, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but it's, uh, it's always the students who kind of enjoy getting their hands in it and matching wits with the, uh, matching, wit, matching wits with the test makers. That usually kind of bodes well for, I mean, not only for the GMAT, but the ultimate success is business school students and in that, you know, being a, a business leaders of the world in the future, certainly after that. Last call, any questions, comments, or concerns? Last call, last call. If any arise, you can certainly put them in the, uh, can certainly put them in the comments. And uh, one of us from Kaplan or uh, GMAT Club will answer them. Glad you enjoyed it, Pujita. Thank you for coming.
All right. Well, in that case, I guess for those of you still, uh, those of you still milling about, a few then uh, final salt, final thoughts. You practice these overlapping sets. There should be a, a big overlap uh, between you and a high GMAT score. Uh, check out Kaplan's free resources, certainly on a variety of topics. We have a practice test, question of the day, 20-minute uh, workout. I think we have other events uh, scheduled with GMAT Club and Kaplan partnering up uh, for our, but one of the cool things about living in the internet age, all of us from all over the world uh, can get together and discuss these important GMAT topics. But, you know, of course, obviously, whatever you do, you take all topics on the GMAT seriously, of course. And in the meantime, you, you stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, I think there's a good time for all of us to try and stay indoors and do, do GMAT work. Uh, great work in this lesson, folks. And uh, we wish you happy GMATing and uh, onwards and upwards GMAT soldiers.